Observer's Calendar for August 2024 on episode 442 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I am Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky and this podcast is for everybody who enjoys going out under the stars. No night sky to look at this week, Shane. No, not really. Uh, we've got a layer of smoke up there, um, mm. which is becoming our new norm, as we were just talking before you pressed record. But um, yeah, it's too bad because the temperatures are nice and it's been clear other than the smoke. Yeah, it's uh, it's really disappointing to see this uh, smoke moving back in like this, although it's not crazy heavy like it, like it has been in the past, but certainly it is very, very smoky to our north as uh, as we were talking about. I certainly don't like seeing it. It's been humid though, so I don't know. I don't know how much good observing would be done anyway, but hopefully uh, things will uh, blow out here towards the, the end of the week. Um, but yeah, right now we're trying to plan around it because we don't have air conditioning at our house and but at our cabin we have an air circulator which is kind of a funny thing in an old cabin but uh kind of able to stay out here when it gets like this a little bit easier mm. so we shall see we shall see any uh observing plans for august um yeah i have some days booked off around the new moon so all weather dependent as usual, but if I can get away to grasslands, uh, that would be the plan or maybe my uncle's farm. Uh, so with those, like with the two, you know, blocks, East block and West block of grasslands, and then my uncle's farm, I almost span the, the entire South of the province in terms of options. So hopefully yes. one of those has a favorable forecast. How about you? Yeah. What are your plans? I'm trying to get some work done in the observatory as, as uh, we spoke about over text yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. we're recording a little bit earlier. That's why I sound a little bit more out of it and Shane sounds a little bit more awake. Uh, I usually just be getting up about <laughs> now at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning and uh, yeah, trying to, to get this pier uh, stuff finished up and some other things because we had so much uh, wet weather there and cold weather there for a while that that wasn't possible. But uh, with the smoke and the heat, my builder thinks that uh, he's just going to whip up here um, once in a while and do uh, like a couple hours of work each day uh, over the next couple of weeks. And yeah, hopefully uh, get things squared away there. Should mm. be good. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe the observatory will be finished in August or August of next year. Who knows? I mean, they're never really done, people always say, but I would like to get the pier finished up. I'd like to get the shelves in. I'd like to get flooring on. I'd like to get the power run and then uh, the flashing around the roof. And then uh, then I would call it, uh, you know, done. You know, I think at that point I could just uh, just use it and uh, not really worry about it. I mean, it wasn't even too bad the way the way it works now is not too bad. I just need it uh, at least the very, very least is to get the um, pier short up. The other thing that's going to happen is he's going to stop by hopefully later on this morning, give him a ring and uh, and pop the saddle plates. He said he'd help me pop the saddle plates off the mount mm. because um, since it's more or less out of commission and I'm going to go away for a few days and we have all the smoke anyway, I thought that I would get the the new saddle plates on order. But you have to take them apart in order to uh, figure out which ones you need. And then, of course, they, they need to be off. So plus it's it's makes the mount a little bit lighter when you pop those off. And since we have to sort of dismantle it anyway, might as well take them off and then take the mount off. And then, then I can play around with those and get the new ones on order. Who knows? They might take them, you know, three or four weeks to come in at least anyway. So, but I, I'm estimating the mount will be off until uh, the September long weekend anyhow. So probably uh, give me a, a good amount of time to get those parts in. Okay. Well, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Take yeah. advantage of the whole opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. We got some uh, neat stuff coming up here in August, which hopefully by then the, the smoke is clear out for, um, on the fourth Mercury is stationary. Not that you can really so much see that, but, um, Venus 
uh, starts coming into the evening sky a little bit more uh, since the the sun sets earlier and earlier. Uh, Venus will be about uh, 1.7 degrees away from the moon this evening on the 5th. And on the 6th of August, we have the minor planet 7 Iris at opposition, which is at uh, magnitude 8.1. And Iris was discovered in uh, August August 13th, uh, 1847, by J.R. Hind of London, of Hind's variable nebula fame, for those that uh, have looked at that. And it was Hind's first asteroid discovery, and only the seventh, thus seven Iris, uh, to be discovered, named after the Greek goddess of rainbows. And uh, it is a large main belt asteroid, and possibly a remnant of uh, planetesimal uh, or a remnant planetesimal orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. And it is the fourth brightest object in the asteroid belt. So it's one of those S-type stony meteorites or meteorite-type comets or <laughs> asteroids. I don't know. I'm getting all mixed up. I'm watching you edit. <laughs> You're distracting. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, um, then on the 6th of the next night, so we have these two, uh, or I guess that's the same night, um, we have these two asteroids, the other is 16 Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, which is at opposition and magnitude 9.3. And Psyche was discovered by uh, de Gasparri on 17th of March, 1852, named after the Greek goddess. And the prefix 16 was that it was the 16th one uh, discovered. It's an M-type. And so it's one of the more massive asteroids. So people can hunt those down, just uh, pop them into your... Uh, planetarium software and uh, should be able to find them. You might be able to go take a look at these. I'm trying to get things set up. I actually bought a new edition of Sky Safari this week for working on the calendar. Oh, so okay. can I actually look those up? And here we go. See if we can find it. It's not finding it in my little findy thing. Maybe my software needs to be rebooted. Hmm. I'm just going to see. Oh, yeah, here we go. Seven Iris. And I'm going to take it into August. We'll see where it is. All right. Yeah, it's in Capricornus. Actually, it's pretty close to like uh, the uh, Saturn Nebula, NGC 7009. Not too bad. Okay. And, here's, and Psyche is in Aquarius. Actually, they're super close together. Ooh, well, that's kind handy. Of cool. If you're trying for one, you might as well try for both. Yeah, how far away are they? That's kind of cool. Not quite in the same field of view, but if if you uh, lots of people use it, you can hear my. I haven't figured out how to turn the sound effects off yet. Um, but yeah, if you were using like a wide field like whatever the equivalent of an old 50 millimeter lens is, you could easily get those in the same field of view. Mm -hmm. well, good opportunity. Yeah. On the 6th also, so lots happening on the 6th. We've yeah, got uh, two asteroids, and then Mercury is going to be about 7 degrees below the moon this evening. Okay. So, so that'll be a nice In the general one. neighborhood. Yeah, that'll be pretty nice as well, sitting over on the western sky. I'm just going to take a quick peek at that just while I got it all set up here. Oh, because you're already on the 6th. Yeah. Let's go. Where's Mercury? So I'd like to get some good Mercury observations in. I was, I was setting up the, um, the stuff for next year. And I was sending you guys a few uh, little tidbits here and there. So, yeah, should be good. Yeah, there's Venus and the moon. And, yeah, Venus and the moon together. But, yeah, Mercury is pretty low on the horizon. I'm just looking. On the 5th, actually, Venus and the moon are super tight together. They're only a couple degrees apart, about two degrees apart. You can get them in the binocular field pretty handily if you get a nice view to the uh, a nice view to the due west. So that's a nice one there. Mm -hmm. 
take a look at that. And then on the seventh, we have these du uh, double moon shadow transits on Jupiter, and they're really kicking up pretty good here now. So got this one um, set in Eastern time uh, for 2.54 a.m. Of course, that's going to be uh, just about 1 a.m. here in Saskatchewan time. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, 2.54 a.m. Eastern time, we have those two shadow transits going uh, across Jupiter. So people can check those out if they have a telescope. And then the moon is at Apogee on the 8th. And then on the 11th, Mars pairs with Jupiter all week. And that will be in the morning sky, of course. So mm -hmm. they get pretty nice and tight together there for the whole week. Yeah. Also, yeah. Wasn't did, was it you or Mike that sent that uh, sky safari screenshot? Like that was me. Uh, that was you. Yeah. Really close. Um, that'll be kind of neat to see. Yeah. Let me just grab that. I can stick that in the, uh, in the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that one was pretty cool. I just happened to run over that just when I was playing around with the uh, with the software. So oh, that was on the fourteenth, I think that screenshot. Yeah, I think they get the closest on the fourteenth. So I think my mm -hmm. notes say the eleventh. It's the week of the eleventh. They're they're pretty close all week, mm -hmm. but on that night, you can put them both in a telescope. Yeah, that'll be a, a fun observation if anybody's up early. Yeah, I think that's probably about the most interesting one of the week because you have them in a dark sky and you have them for a period of time. Um, I think if that was an evening sky phenomena, uh, it would be a much bigger event. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I will get up and try to take a peek at that one because you'd be able to see, of course, uh, Mars and then Jupiter and then the moons of Jupiter. And they're in and amongst the Hyades. They're sort of right in between the horns of Taurus. Mm -hmm. I just thought it looked like the image looked really cool. I mean, to your eye, if you have a nice dark, clear sky, that's just going to look super neat. Yeah. Just how it's positioned within Taurus is yeah. really cool. Yeah. Like I was thinking about this. So I've been working on the calendar and, I'm, you know, in the calendar, you know, today we're using the data from the calendar and as the months go by, that's, that's how we do this. Um, but when we were standing out at grasslands and we were looking at, um spica be revealed from uh the moon because the moon had just occulted it um and the moon was sitting right next to spica and then we had the milky way and then we had like a distant lightning storm and then we had uh, uh you know some other things uh, that you know like you you could see the double cluster and andromeda mm -hmm. rising sort of in the in the north uh, east and just all that stuff and anyway you're just standing there like watching this and it's just so phenomenal to be able to be at under a dark sky uh, seeing these kind of events but mm -hmm. you know when you when you sit and just kind of go over it like this it kind of prepares you for maybe how it would look and then it's neat to go through all these every month and then to go out you know as as conditions permit and to be actually able to uh to check them out and see them start to get a better idea over the years of how the stuff is going to look and what's going to look really cool and what's going to kind of be like uh meh you know mm -hmm. it's kind of mm -hmm. funny mm -hmm. i and also like i noticed how with the um like with amateur astronomers and the people that are going out and doing it quite a bit some of this stuff we definitely uh appreciate in a different way than uh than people who aren't uh, going out as much like members of the public or whatever, because when, when we're looking at the moon revealing Spica and you could see how sort of fluorescent blue or, or sort of jade blue maybe is, is a better way of putting it. Um, Spica look next to the moon, which usually you would maybe think that you were just looking at secondary color in your telescope or the atmosphere or something. If, if you saw that, um, but just the stark contrast between a star and the moon uh, is really mind blowing for us amateur astronomers because it really pulls that color forward. I notice that with anything that gets close to the moon, and maybe that's something that you know I, we don't say as much in the show. But when we're talking about how uh, the moon is pairing with with different things, whether it's a planet or a star, uh, that's one of the reasons why is that you you can definitely see things uh, that you otherwise can't. Yeah. 
no, that's uh, that's a great point. And having that contrast or comparison is is always like a, a big bonus, or, or a sort of allows you sometimes to do some observing that otherwise wouldn't, you know, probably be possible or maybe successful is a better way to put it. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, it's super cool to see this stuff. On the eleventh, uh, we have the lunar X uh, visible near the crater Werner, and so uh, that's visible in. The, it's sort of 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that's still going to be way light here. But I think over on the, uh, you know, sort of far eastern coast or in the UK, you'd be able to see that. Hmm. Cool. And the straight wall will be visible on the 12th. We've talked about that quite a bit in the past. But that's uh, the lunar X is just a chance alignment of the light cast across two craters makes it look like there's an X on the moon. And then the straight wall is uh, like an escarpment or fault like feature um, that is just like a perfectly straight line on the moon, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah. It's very neat. And also we have the Perseid meter showers. Once that moon sets, um, you'll have a nice Perseid meter shower early in the morning. You want to get up early 4am is around the best time to go out uh, into the pre-dawn hours between the 12th and the 16th of August in order to see the Perseid meteor showers with a zenith hourly rate of 100, meaning that you could see up to 100 meteors per hour on that night. Yeah, one of the more famous meteor showers, uh, largely due to volume and time of the year when it's uh, you know most active. So I always enjoyed looking at them, um, but you know, it's more so just I'm out doing other astronomy and I happen to catch some Perseids. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to go out to look for them. And I mean, you know, I would see like a satellite and the guy was looking at meteors or whatever. I didn't really know what I was, what I was looking at too much. Every once in a while, you know, you'd, uh, you'd see a meteor or whatever. Um, but yeah, probably didn't see too, too many over the years, you know, cause when you're a kid, or at least when I was a kid, I just didn't have the attention span. I go out and look for like 30 seconds. And if I didn't see anything, I was done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you can see lots of meteors if you go out on those nights. I've certainly seen up to 100 an hour, definitely uh, during outbursts. Yeah, it can get really active. Um, it's uh, like all meteor showers are kind of hard to predict. So you never really know what you're going to get until that night. But, um, you know, if you're out, it's definitely worth, you know, just spending some time looking without any optics, just using your eyes and see what you can see. A good way to look is to set up a, a lawn chair, particularly a reclining lawn chair. If you can get one, take some binoculars out with you to kind of scan around the sky or the Milky Way. And then uh, you you want to face kind of sort of towards the northeast a bit. It doesn't really matter that much but if you face uh generally in that direction that's uh going to give you a slightly better odds at seeing them but if you have a few people you can all kind of face in slightly different directions and it's it's unpredictable i mean you can go out and sit there for an hour and see nothing or you can see two or three or you can see 20 or 30 mm -hmm. it's uh it's highly variable yes um on the 14th we have these two moon shadows visible on Jupiter again. And that's uh, going to be well placed for us because it'll be around 2.30 in the morning uh, for, for us here in Saskatchewan or about 4.30 Eastern Daylight Time for those uh, in, in the larger population centers. Be able to see those two shadows going across uh, Jupiter. And what they are is there's a couple moons and they're passing between the sun and the cloud tops of Jupiter. And when they do that, they cast their shadows onto those cloud tops, just like our moon will cast its shadow onto the surface of our planet when we have a solar eclipse. Basically the same thing. Mm, right on. I say basically because I think that uh, we have the unique phenomenon in the solar system of having a moon and a sun that are essentially equal size so that when, when our moon covers the sun, it just barely does so, so that you can see the corona and everything else. Whereas I think with the, uh, with the other moons, um, they're either too big or too small to either cause a full eclipse or, or it's a, it's a way full eclipse. So it covers, you know, uh, a much larger area of the solar disk than, than just the disk itself. Mm -hmm. On the 18th, 
Mercury's at inferior conjunction, so it's going to dive back down. We'll be able to see that. And then um, on the 18th also, the moon occults Neptune at 321. A lot, of, a lot of AM things this month, eh? You'll have to set your alarm, Shane. Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll probably I might get up and try to take a take a peek for for that one. Mm-hmm. On the twenty first, the moon is at uh, perigee, and then on the twenty first, I have the twenty fifth, twenty one, but it's oh, yeah. first. That's my uh, the uh, we also have two shadows visible. It's in the uh, eight oh eight on the EDT. And because of that, that's mostly going to be a a daytime event. However, I guess here that would be six. So eh, that's kind of getting into the daylight sky. But if you're on the very West coast, it's going to be five. So that would just maybe barely be, uh, be visible. Uh, Also staying on the 21st, we have uh, the moon just half a degree below the, um, the moon on that evening. And then on the 25th, that's the anniversary of the uh, first binary pulsar being discovered 50 years ago Hmm. by Joe Taylor. Who knew? Russell Hulse. On the 27th, we have Jupiter, Mars, Uranus, Saturn, Moon, and Neptune all in a line that evening. I always like those alignments. Um, Just fun to to see it, and it really helps visualize the ecliptic. Uh, I like it. Yeah. I'm just going to go and take a peek at that because I'm wondering, because we have the uh, several of the stars there in Taurus at that time. And I'm just wondering if uh, if it lines up with any of those or if, if it does, how, how it does that. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, yeah, it's kind of kind of an interesting one i'm gonna pop it ahead probably to see the lineup probably the best night for us is uh on the t- morning of the 26th about 4 30 in the morning you get uranus the moon jupiter and mars and then you have the hyades um right between them so that's going to look pretty cool and then way over on the right you have uh saturn and neptune so it should be pretty cool. You know, this one should probably say, I guess like, well, I guess it's Neptune, but yeah, Saturn and Neptune, they're, they're sort of further away than, yeah, than maybe uh, I was thinking when I made that up. But yeah, anyway, I mean, they're all in the sky at the same time. Um, on the 30th, Fred Whipple uh discover the dirty snowball theory of comets. Uh, he died about 20 years ago. And then on the 31st, we have the Origid meteor shower, which only has 10 meteors per hour. It's visible, best visible in the very late pre-dawn sky. But I think the Origids is one of those meteor showers that uh, has become more uh, pronounced in recent years. So some of these ones I'm kind of throwing in anyway. Hmm. Sounds good. Then we have pile of comets. 13P Olbers is at magnitude 6.9, currently about 7th magnitude, and uh, slowly fading. I think it was a little brighter, might get brighter again. Um, and then 12P Pons Brooks is fading at magnitude 8. And then uh, A3 Shushan Atlas is at 9th magnitude. And, and getting that's the, every yeah. day. I that's think that's the one, the one that's everybody's get, watching. Yeah. yeah, sorry, it's getting lower. Yeah, it's going lower on the horizon. Yeah, the next couple of weeks here, like kind of going into August, I guess will probably tell us whether or not this will be the naked eye comet that some forecasts are saying it will be. So we'll have to keep a watch on that one. Yeah. Sounds good. Anything else to add to the show, Shane? Uh, no, that is it, sir. All right. Well, please subscribe, share the show with other stargazers you know. Send us your show ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, 
check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>